So something occurs to me, actually, it's not funny, but all relationships end. I repeat that, all relationships end. Either someone dies or, or, or you know, that's, you know, or either you die first or they die first. But at some point, all relationships end in some way, shape or form. So today we're going to talk about what men must go through these five stages before they'll commit to you. And I'm sorry if I laughed at that, but it just occurs to me that many of us in the dating, mating and dating, mating and relating marketplace have probably have had multiple relationships in their lives that didn't reach that level of what I call all in, all in. To me, that's the epitome of uh, a significant relationship. And it doesn't have to be marriage, but two people go all in with one another. And if you're not familiar with my love scale, one of the principles in the love scale is commitment. And there are basically three lay levels of commitment that occur in our current dating environment. For those of us in midlife, and midlife is after baby making years and before retirement. So most of my demographic is between the ages of 42 and 69 most of the people I speak to. So, so what is the first level of commitment? The first level of commitment is an agreement most likely to be monogamous and exclusive with one another. Monogamous and exclusive with one another. And these are agreements that two people make with one another. In fact, this is probably the predominant, predominant relationships today are what's known as casual. They agree to monogamy, which means not having sex with other people. And they agree to exclusivity. They agree to exclusivity. Now, the next level of commitment is what I call the second level is teamwork. And that's what we're going to talk about today is teamwork. And the stages men go through to get to this level of teamwork. This is where you're operating as a team with one another that helps you reach this third level of what I call all in. And some people never reach that third level. And we're going to talk about that as well. So what I'm about to share with you comes from the Tuckman stages of development for developing a team. The Tuckman, by the way, someone write this down in the chat box or in the comment, Tuckman model, uh, Tuckman stages of development. This is for teams. These are, by the way, these are in the professional world. We're using this analogy. We're using this structure, excuse me, to illustrate something in the romantic realm, because I believe this applies in any type of team situation. And we said that the second level of commitment is teamwork with one another. I think this will per perfectly illustrate this. So there's five layers to this, if you will, or five stages. And the first stage is what's known as forming. Forming, F-O-R-M-I-N-G, forming. Someone write that down for me. Now, this is mostly focused on the first 90 days of two people getting to know each other is the forming stage. The first 90 days is critically important because in our current dating environment, I would probably say for every 100 people that go out on a first date, probably 95 of them never it never reaches a second date. And well, well let's make it an easier number or not easier. We'll make it that number 90 out of 100 people going on a first date never reach a second date. But of those 10 people that had a second date, I would venture to say that probably five of those never make it to a third date, okay? Five of those never make it to a third date. And I would venture to say that probably two of those never make it, excuse me, am I doing this math right? What's left, okay, five of those don't make it. Three more don't make it to the 10th date, okay? They don't make it to the 10th date. And one of those doesn't make it past the 90 days. I would say one out of every 100 first dates that happen today ever make it past now, I know that's very like, oh, my God. Well, this is where doing your due diligence, doing your pre-qualifying. This is what I teach in my private coaching. You can check out the link below to schedule a discovery call with me. My job is to help you avoid those 100 dates and get it down to five strong candidates. And that's what I help women in coaching, in my private coaching. So the forming is those first 90 days. 
The first 90 days is, do we like each other enough to decide if we want to enter into a relationship with one another? This is where you're maybe agreeing to monogamy. You're agreeing, agreeing to exclusivity. And that should happen within the first 90 days. This is the forming stage of two people. And just think about Tuckman's model is for groups. I just want you to say, you've got this project at work. You've got 10 people involved. First, you have to get to know each other well enough to see what your strengths and weaknesses and that sort of thing um, are in your in the professional capacity. This holds true in the romantic sense as well. The second stage is called storming. This is where differences start to emerge. Now, it doesn't happen to have, doesn't necessarily happen in 90 days. Sometimes it can happen right off the bat. But this is where differences start to emerge. Your communication style differences emerge. And this is where, where a lot of couples rarely get past this space of storming, which is conflict. See, unfortunately, most human beings have poor communication skills, poor emotional maturity, poor relationship skills. They don't really know how to resolve conflict in a non-confrontational way. If you've never read the book, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, I highly recommend reading this. All the books I recommend are listed below. Why? By the way, this should have been titled Compassionate Communication. See, unfortunately, most couples don't make it. Many of, out of those, out of every 10 couples that make it past the 90 day mark, okay, uh, I'm going to assume that a lot of couples out of those, out of 10 couples that make it past the 90 day mark, probably half of them don't make it past the storming stage because they have poor communication skills. Now, I know my audience is women, and you all blame men as being commun poor communicators. Let me just tell you something. Men are pointing the finger this way. Women are pointing the finger this way. This is, by the way, this is, if you ever ask a couples therapist, ask, sit, if you have anyone you know in your life that's a couples therapist, this is what they'll tell you. Each person goes in blaming their partner for the problem in the relationship without not looking in the mirror. I'm here to to espouse that I believe most human beings have poor communication skills. This is why they never make it past the storming stage. But if you do get past these threshold barriers, these, these storms, and you start building real trust with one another, you start building real trust with one another, you can reach the next level, the next stage, and that's known as norming norming, okay? Overcoming differences. The goal is greater than the parts. This is where acceptance starts uh, creeping in. Now, a lot of couples never reach this level of acceptance. They never reach this level of norming because they're different. So I want you to think of, you have a difference in, you have a difference in personality. You have a difference in behavior. You have a difference in habits. You have a difference in needs, okay? Oftentimes when there's difference, there's friction with the other person. So the first level is at least tolerating the difference with another person. But that's not a very healthy space to be to tolerate a difference. I'm going to repeat that. That's not a very healthy place to be. Because when you tolerate something for too long that feels misaligned with you, and, and let me be clear, I'm not talking about bad behavior. I'm talking about personality differences, you know, habits, uh, behaviors, needs. I'm not talking about bad, you know, people that have... Um, you know, that gaslight you, that dismiss you, that verbally abusive. That's not what I'm talking about in differences. I'm talking about subtle personality differences, subtle difference in habits, subtle differences in needs, okay? So when we get to a place of understanding, we can go to another level of what, excuse me, from tolerance to understanding. If we at least understand why our partner does the way they are, that's at least reaching up to the level of starting to reach a deeper level of love when we begin to understand our partner and the way they do things differently. But then taking it another level is going to a place of acceptance. 
going to a place of acceptance, when you can accept your partner's differences. And acceptance means you don't want to change them. There's an old narrative that says men marry women, they don't change. That means their physical appearance doesn't change. And women marry men hoping they do change. They want behaviors and personality and habits to change. Well, trust me, if you're in this, if you're trying to reach this level of norming with a partner, if you can't accept your differences, it's going to be mostly storming and it'll eventually end or fail. So the next level beyond norming, and this usually takes about a year to reach this place, is when you start to reach a level of what's known as performing. Performing. This is where you have a shared vision in life. You're growing together as a couple. You're viewing the world as a team. That's why this is Tuckman's team model. Because in commitment, if you're not reaching this level of team, like where you're performing together as a one unit, see, very few couples reach this level because all they're focused on is, did you have a good time? I hope you had a good time. Did you have a good day? I hope you had a good day. You're all focused in the doing and not the real experiencing from a heart-centered level. You know, most couples don't know how to build trust through emotional intimacy. We are so hyper-dependent on being of service to one another. This is why in the book, The Five Love Languages, if you're not familiar with it, Acts of Service is where a lot of couples focus all their attention and they're not really building real emotional intimacy with one another through the sharing of our fears, our doubts, our appreciations for one another, our admirations for one another, our respect for one another. They're not coming at it from an expressive place. I'm going to tell you, you're doing it wrong. If you want, if you want true connection with another being, it requires using your mouth. It requires using words to uh, particularly in the area of appreciation for one another. So few couples sit and actually share with one another what they truly appreciate in one another, what they admire in one another, what you respect in one another. I think this should be a regular practice as your Sunday routine is actually develop, the, invest in the emotional intimacy with one another. And sure, you're going to go to farmer's market and movies and do things together. And certainly physical intimacy, sex is an important component to a healthy, happy relationship. But if you want to perform outside of the norm, excuse me, the mediocre, that it requires building emotional intimacy because that builds trust. Identifying and addressing each other's needs. Identifying your own needs, really. Like what is one of your highest needs in relationship? Mine, for example, happens to be reciprocity. To be reciprocal with one another, not from a tit from tat place, but from a place of mutually giving and investing in one another, it's one of my highest needs in relationship. Verbal expression is, I mean, I'm just, I'm in sharing with me, I sharing with you my own because I'm inviting you to explore this for yourself. So we just covered the four principles within the Tuckman model, forming, storming, norming, and performing. But there's one more level that might that definitely deserves to be addressed, and that is known as adjourning or mourning. Adjourning or mourning. See, good, good human. Let me reframe that. Sovereign human beings, people who know their own worth, can recognize when two people aren't necessarily good teammates with one another. See, not everybody is designed to be with one another. I started this conversation with the, with the understanding that you, you're going to have multiple relationships in your life. Not every relationship is going to work out. And some relationships need to adjourn. A good couple knows when a relationship has reached its ending point. And while death do us part is very admirable for some people, it's rather foolish for other people. I'm going to repeat that. Death do us part is admirable. But for some couples, it's a very foolish place to be. This is why if you haven't read the book, Conscious Uncoupling, 
by Catherine Woodward Thomas. I highly recommend reading this book. Some couples should adjourn their relationship. If you've been following my channel for a while, you probably know that I was in a significant relationship that ended 11 months ago. She didn't like living in California, and there were some other factors that made us a little bit different with one another. And while we were great roommates, we were great teammates with one another, we didn't reach that all-in level. And because of that, our relationship adjourned. And while I was, I, I was willing to go the distance, I'm grateful that she ended the relationship because there was some fundamental pieces missing in our relationship. We were in two different places in our lives and it took us about a year to figure this out. That's why we enter into a dating process. That's why we humans enter into relationships to determine if we're really good teammates with one another. Because when two people can operate from a good teammate perspective where they can actually perform as a team with one another, this is the state, this is where you can reach that all in level. Remember I said, first is monogamy and exclusivity. Next is teammates, which we just outlined the stage of teammates using the Tuckman's model. But ultimately, when you're in a state of performing, if you can't perform, you must adjourn. And in that adjournment, there might be a mourning period for that. Take time for yourself. But if you have, if you don't need, if you, if there's, if you're if performing at a really high level as teammates with one another, that's the relationships that go all in. Those are the relationships that should either move in together or get married, or at least have a spiritual marriage of some sort, or some agreement with one another that says we are fully committed to this. You might want to Google ketubah, which is a Jewish term, uh, or it's a Yiddish term. Well, in Judaism, it's called a ketubah. And this is an agreement of how your relationship will kind of, um, the framework for your relationship. Is this sinking in? Is this resonating with you? Please let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Post a comment below. I do my best to read all the comments within the first 24 hours. As always, if you find value in my videos, please hit that like button. Please share this video. Please subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you can be notified of new videos. And also, if you want to connect with me directly, there's links below to schedule a discovery call with me to see if working with a coach is right for you. There is um, my group called Midlife Love Mastery. There's all the books I recommend, including my book, What the Heck is Self-Love Anyway, listed below. And also, you can get my dating vows and follow me on Instagram. All right, I'm going to wrap up this video as I always do. First off, give myself a big, gigantic Jonathan Merrick of self-love. I'm going to reach into the camera and give you a hug of love if that's okay. I'm going to ask you to turn to someone, a pet, a teddy bear, a pillow, and give it or them a hug of love because hugs are a great source of love. And let's face it, we could all use more love in our lives. Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.